you've attended a single film studies class, you've probably seen this. Breathless, the film that helped jumpstart the French New Wave and make Jean-Luc Godard one of the most famous directors in history. What you might not know is who the man in the hat is. Quelle est votre plus grande ambition dans la vie? Disparu ce go. Devenir immortel, et puis mourir. This minor character is being played by one of Godard's biggest influences and one of the most influential genre directors ever, Jean-Pierre Melville, sometimes called the father of the new wave. Melville's work has inspired a multitude of directors from all over the world. But despite his legacy, he still remains relatively obscure to American audiences. In an attempt to correct that, we'll be taking a look at Melville's life and work. Melville was born Jean-Pierre Grumbach in Paris in 1917. From a young age, he had an obsession with film, going to the theater as often as he could. After the fall of France in 1940, he joined the French Resistance, taking the name of American writer Herman Melville as a codename. His experience in the Resistance would massively influence his filmmaking, creating in him an admiration for outlaws. After the war, he kept his codename and moved into independent film with his own studio. While Melville worked in several genres, it's safe to say that the genre he's most associated with and had an impact on is the crime genre. Influenced by American film noir and gangster pictures, Melville used the stylistic elements and tropes of these movies frequently, repurposing them for more explicitly existential films. Take Le Samurai, for example, Melville's most famous film. Le Samurai follows the story of a professional hitman, Jeff Costello, who's betrayed by his employer after their job. Or as the title implies, Jeff is strongly associated with a samurai code of conduct, and takes great pride in that code. So the film asks how someone could live in the modern world with such a code. The answer is not well. This character, the honorable, skilled criminal adorned with a hat and trench coat, appears in nearly every Melville crime film. If you went to France and you looked at the, the gangster films that Jean-Pierre Melville did, which were kind of very similar, even though he was going about it in a French way, um, it's very similar to what I was trying to do, where he was like, he'd take genre stories from Warner Brothers' heyday and then kind of do it in his French style and you know, have it put, take place in Pagal as opposed to Hell's Kitchen. But again, he had a, a, a sense of style for his characters with their snap rim fedoras and their, uh, uh, and their trench coats and their raincoats. Yeah, Bogart wore that kind of stuff, but man, when you see Belmondo wear it and when you see Elan Delon wear it, wow, okay, it has this specific look, and that became the suit of armor for his character. They are characters Melville greatly admires, but understands they can't exist in a civil society. Thus, they are doomed to be hunted by the law. But these characters aren't just stony looks hiding in trench coats. Melville makes sure to humanize his criminals. Take the Cirque de Rogue, for example, a heist film which follows three men trying to rob a high-end jewelry shop. One of the characters, Jansen, is a marksman who they need to snipe a security alarm with in one shot. He's also an alcoholic ex-cop who finished a bender just a few days ago. The two other men, Corey and Vogel, are being chased by police, so they don't really have the time or the luxury to get a different man. His character traits do two jobs. First, it grounds the character with a common and tragic vice. Secondly, it adds a layer of tension to the upcoming heist. Will he be able to make the shot? These little human touches inform many of Melville's characters. Melville's use of suspense is some of the best in film. The previous example shows how he does this on a larger plot-based scale seeding the plot with scenes to suggest how things could go wrong. But he's also masterful with moment-to-moment -moment scene construction. Take this moment in Army of Shadows. Uh, the film follows a group of French resistance fighters in Nazi-occupied France. Our main character, Philippe Gerber, has been arrested by the Gestapo after a failed rescue attempt. Having seen how the Gestapo tortures people in previous scenes, we know nothing good is going to happen. We spend minutes with him and his fellow prisoners before we spent even more time being led somewhere through the labyrinthine prison. We reach a long corridor where the attending officer tells them this. Dans une minute, vous allez vous tourner le dos aux mitrailleuses et face au mur. Vous allez courir aussi vite que vous pourrez. Nous n'allons pas tirer tout de suite. Nous allons vous laisser une chance. Qui arrivera jusqu'au mur sera exécuté plus tard avec les condamnés prochains. On peut toujours essayer, on n'a rien à perdre. 
Il sait très bien ce que veulent mes jambes. Il se prépare au spectacle. Mais je me sens mieux enchaîné par son assurance que par mes fers. I won't spoil what happens, but I will say that there are a few times in film that I felt as tense as I have waited for this starting gun. The entire film is an exercise in this relentless tension building. It's downright oppressive. Mais il se trouve que les histoires de gangsters représentent un véhicule facile à exploiter pour cette forme de, de tragédie moderne qu'est le, le film noir tiré de la, de la littérature noire américaine. C'est un fourre-tout, on peut y mettre un peu tout ce qu'on veut, de bon ou de mauvais, mais c'est quand même assez facile de, de se servir de ce véhicule pour raconter des histoires qui vous tiennent à cœur sur la liberté individuelle, sur l'amitié, sur les rapports entre les hommes, pas toujours obligatoirement sur l'amitié d'ailleurs, sur la trahison, qui est un, un moteur essentiel du livre noir américain. <rire> 